Hello everyone, Happy New Year. So glad to have you all with me here in 2022 as we continue looking into our question of whether or not the worst monsters are no longer hiding in the dark, but out here in the light of the technology beaming right into our faces. You might be wondering, Arya, why are you still wearing your old Santa hat? It's past Christmas now, and the simple reason is because as soon as I take off this hat and I take down those lights, I'm gonna plunge into a deep dark sorrow, and so I'd rather not rip that bandaid off just yet. So let's just indulge me in this as we dive into yet another not so fun story together. In particular, I wanna give a heads up and a trigger warning that this case does deal a lot with rape and sexual assault. Let's begin. Today, we look into Stephen Port, a man who became known as the Grinder Killer after taking the lives of several young queer men in London after meeting them online. Port was a chef who spent most of his life in East London. He came out as gay in his mid-20s. In his early 30s, he moved out of his parents' home and into his own apartment in Barking, not far from where he grew up. At this time, social media was becoming more popular and Port was an avid user. He'd not only create personal profiles of himself, but sometimes he created profiles which used different names or even profiles for completely made up people. He started doing sex work, first working as an escort and then as a procurer as well, and he began taking drugs, in particular, GHB or the date rape drug. Upon later search of Port's computer, it was discovered that he had a keen interest in a very particular type of pornography, namely drug rape porn. He'd use search terms like unconscious boys or drugged and raped. Eventually, Port's online interest began to spill into the real world. He began to invite young men over to his place. While each person's story is their own, they all shared some commonalities. Firstly, they all met Port online, either through an app or website. Secondly, they all recall being drugged either by drink or syringe, which rendered them unconscious. And they all recall waking up to Port raping them. In total, eight survivors would later come forward with their encounters with Port. Four others, however, would never get the chance to tell their story. In June 2014, Port would make his first kill when he targeted 23-year-old Anthony Walgate. In the early morning hours of June 19, 2014, emergency services were alerted by a call from a passerby that a young man was lying on the pavement on Cook Street and barking. The caller said that the young man looked as if he had collapsed or had a seizure, or maybe he was just drunk. When the authorities arrived, they found his shirt was pulled up, exposing his stomach as if he had been dragged. Anthony Walgate was pronounced dead. His cause of death would later be determined to be an overdose of GHB. That anonymous caller was none other than Stephen Port. The police found him in his apartment just steps away from where Walgate was and got a witness statement from him in which he explained that he had found Walgate after returning home from a late shift at work. However, Walgate had experience working as an escort and showed his friends a photo of his client before leaving. In general, that's actually just a good idea to do, I mean, even just for a date or, or something like that. When police realized Port was the man pictured, they arrested him on suspicion of perverting the course of justice, which is similar to obstruction of justice in the US, and questioned him for two days until he finally admitted to hiring Walgate through Sleepy Boys, an escort site. He told police that Walgate had taken drugs from small bottles once in his apartment, but he began to feel ill at some point. The two had sex before Walgate fell asleep. Port claimed to have gone to work with Walgate still asleep, only to find him stiff in bed when he returned, at which point he panicked and took him to the street, fearing he'd be accused of murder. While Port's computer was seized, its data was not examined by police until a year after Walgate's death. If they had looked sooner, they would have found that he'd have searched for his disturbing pornography of choice just minutes after viewing Walgate's escort profile, days before they met up. Ultimately, Port was released on bail. <sighs> I feel, I really am I just a broken record at this point about police incompetence, but that itself is just so, it's beyond frustrating. He was released on bail and they had, they had his computer, but they didn't examine it until a year after the death. And spoiler alert, more people die. I don't know where the rest of this goes, but truly, uh, the rest of the blood is on the police's hand as well. Two months after Anthony Walgate's death, another young man was found dead just 500 meters away in a churchyard by a dog walker. Gabriel Kovari was a 22-year-old Slovakian immigrant who had just moved to London from Spain when he decided to rent a room from Port. He had spent some time living in South London with a man named John Pape, whom he met online, and who insisted Kovari could continue staying with him, but Kovari decided to leave anyway. A neighbor came over one night to meet Kovari by an invitation 
attention from Port. Kovari would later text the neighbor the next day saying, Steven is not a nice person. When the neighbor later asked Port about Kovari, he told him he went to stay with a soldier he met online. Kovari's body was found on August 28th. His shirt was pulled up, exposing his stomach, much like Walgate. He had been propped up against the wall of the churchyard and appeared to have died of an overdose. His death was labeled non-suspicious. Kavari's former roommate, Pape, was alerted by police of his death but was given very little information. He began to research what happened when he found the report on Walgate's similar death and the proximity to where Kavari was found. Pape reached out to Kavari's ex-boyfriend in Spain, Thierry Omodio, who was conducting research of his own. He had found that a John Luck was following Kavari's Facebook profile. Omodio reached out to Luck asking how they knew each other and informed him of Kavari's death. Luck expressed shock at the news and noted that the two met on Grinder and spent a couple of nights together around August 22nd. Remember, Kovari was found on August 24th. Luck told him that a man named Tony had picked Kovari up from his place. On September 19th, the night before Port's next victim would be found, he supplied more information. According to Luck, Tony told him that Kovari had left for a party in Barking with a man named Dan. On September 20th, 2014, the same dog walker who had discovered Gabriel Kovari in the churchyard three weeks earlier discovered the lifeless body of 21-year-old Daniel Whitworth in the exact same location and position as Kovari. Jesus Christ, this poor dog walker. His shirt was also pulled up like the previous two victims. However, this time the body was found on a blue bedsheet and appeared to have a suicide note with it. In it, he stated that he accidentally killed his friend Gabriel Kovari with GHB while they were having sex. Interestingly, it also included this line, by the way, please do not blame the guy I was with last night. We only had sex, then I left. He knows nothing of what I have done. <laughs> That's so funny. That's so fucking stupid. Uh, what a... <laughs> <laughs> he may as well just said, please, by the way, please don't blame Stephen Port. Stephen Port knows nothing about this. Jesus Christ. Some killers are just fucking morons. Whitworth's cause of death was an overdose of GHB mixed with sleeping pills. This was the Dan that Luck was seemingly referring to. When Emodio informed Luck that Dan was also deaf, he preferred, maybe Dan knew what happened to Gabe and could not live with the guilt or something like that. Emodio's efforts to get John Luck to contact police or vice versa were all in vain. John Luck, of course, was a fake profile set up by Stephen Port. Port had met Whitworth on a gay social networking site called FitLads. They had agreed to meet up for drinks before moving to Port's apartment for dinner. Police label Whitworth's death as non-suspicious, despite a pathologist noting bruising in his armpits, often a result of handling a body which most likely occurred before death. Police labeled this death as non-suspicious. They labeled the last death as non-suspicious. I mean, the police... That's them bungling it if that wasn't obvious. Additionally, evidence found at the scene was not tested for DNA. Had it been, oh my God. <laughs> I didn't test anything for DNA. I mean, what the fuck? Had it been, the bed sheet, the note, Whitworth's clothes and body would have all pointed to port. All of that. So even just if one of those things, the bed sheet, the note, the clothes or the body, any of it, if any of it had been tested, it would have pointed to Stephen Port and it would have prevented another murder. A detective was quoted as saying that while the deaths of Kavari and Whitworth were unusual and slightly confusing, they were ultimately not suspicious. I'm sorry that I keep stopping this. I'm just, it, it baffles my mind. So the detective admits that it's unusual and even slightly confusing to them, but they're not suspicious at all. Jesus Christ, this is what happens when you move Sergeant Nicholas Angel to the countryside. In early 2015, Port's legal issues surrounding Walgate's death would come back around when he was officially charged with perverting the course of justice and later found guilty. However, the prosecutor noted in court that nothing suggested he was criminally responsible for Walgate's death. What the fuck is going on? It's like, what a, uh, he was sentenced to eight months in prison for this charge, but only served a few before being released in June 2015. Port's final victim would be discovered just months later in September 2015. What in the world is going on? I want you guys to know these are my genuine reactions. I don't read these scripts beforehand. With all the technological advancements that we have and the resources they have at their disposal in a major city too. The body of a 25 year old Jack Taylor was found in mid-September in the same churchyard as Kovari and Whitworth, except on the other side of the churchyard wall. Just like the other men, when his body was discovered, his shirt was pulled up around his stomach. 
he had died of an apparent overdose as well. Taylor lived with his parents and was not out. He used Grinder to meet people with one of those people being Stephen Port. The two had agreed to meet up in the early hours of September 13th at Barking Station and walk to Port's apartment together. Taylor would never be seen alive again. The police once again labeled his death non-suspicious. Taylor's family, however, refused to accept this and began to look into the circumstances themselves. That's when they found information about the other men who had recently died in the area, but the police seemed to turn down every comparison they presented to them. The police did tell them there was CCTV footage of Taylor walking down the street with a man before he died. The family requested it be published to see if anyone could identify the man, and eventually the Metropolitan Police released a still image of Taylor and Port. A local police officer recognized Port, and he was once again arrested on October 15, 2015. On the day of his arrest, the case moved from the local Barking and Dagenham Police to the Metropolitan Police's main homicide and major crime division. The Met soon became aware of all the opportunities the Barking and Dagenham police had in finding and stopping Port. In addition to the DNA on the items found with Whitworth, a simple handwriting analysis of the suicide note showed it did not match Whitworth's handwriting, but it did match Port's. After four days of questioning, Port was charged with four counts of murder on October 18, 2015. In total, Port faced 29 charges, including many related to his survivors who came forward after his arrest, all of which he denied. Port was convicted of each murder murder and numerous other charges. While Port was given a whole life sentence, the father of Daniel Whitworth noted before the sentencing that their family had been given a life sentence of grief. Many have claimed that the police's alleged negligence with these cases was due to the fact that the victims were gay, with some believing that Port may have been stopped sooner if his crimes involved heterosexual relationships. In the end, it took police 15 months to connect Port to the murders. An inquest is currently underway examining the police's actions and potential mishandlings while investigating these tragic deaths. You know, that is a fantastic talking point. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say on it. It could have definitely been because these victims were gay. It's just society's perhaps uh, perspective or the how they view uh, cases involving homosexual victims or perpetrators compared to heterosexual ones. Either way, this was a very, very upsetting case to me. Beyond frustrating, you guys could see. You can see in my face right now, I'm just worn out <laughs> from the sheer, you know, uh, drain on my brain of trying to process how this man just kept getting away with it and how much more, uh, you know, people just kept dying because the police wouldn't do their job. Simple DNA test, simple handwriting analysis. The family of the victim were the ones that had to request photos from CCTV cameras. I mean, it's scary to think that, you know, any of us could be murdered. Our loved ones may never find justice for our murders because people put in charge, people in power that are expected to, you know, bring our would-be killers to justice just aren't doing their job. Now you see why I'm still wearing my Santa hat and I have the Christmas lights up because I need this. I need this. Either way, thank you all so much for taking the time to watch this video as always and keep me company. I really look forward to all the videos that I'll be able to make for you all this year. I hope you'll enjoy them. I'll be trying to make some great videos for you all from here in the bedroom, but also going out there, venturing into the big wide world and maybe doing some exciting stuff out on the field. Either way, I'm excited for you all to check it out and hopefully you enjoy it. In the meantime, as always, if you have any cases you'd like me to cover, shoot me a message, shoot me a DM, slide in there. And who knows, maybe next time I cover a case, it'll be one that you've suggested. Either way, happy new year. And as always, stay safe online.